Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to uh, Grant's Interest Rate Observer Radio. Um, it is a pleasure indeed to have you with us, and a pleasure too, especially, I should say, to uh, have Hubert Horan, who is a, an aviation consultant who has taken up a hobby of analyzing Uber. And uh, readers of Grant's know a little something about the excellence of his work because we featured some of Hubert's thoughts in an issue of Grant's earlier this year at concerning Uber. Uh, so in just a moment, we'll, we'll talk with uh, Hubert Horan about uh, how he sees that, uh, uh, that uh, shall we say, colorful and newsworthy um, ride company in just a moment. Uh, but first, a word from Grant's interest rate observer. Uh, hey, have, have you ever set out to uh, clean the attic but settled down instead to read that pile of old National Geographics that uh, you had actually meant to dust? Well, uh, someone else can clean the attic you'll have had 90 minutes of discovery. Now, the Grant's archival attic doesn't need cleaning, but it's supremely well-stocked. Subscribers may roam at will among 4 million words, the equivalent of, what, 40 full-length books, nonfiction, of course. That's 34 years, providing you with a, a singular, colorful, and generational history of finance in our time. Priceless. Well, not exactly. Pri well, the priceless, to be sure, comes with your subscription, so please do subscribe. Our mission is to uh, restore critical judgment, impart perspective, and serve up original, deeply researched investment ideas. Every two weeks for well nigh 34 years, grants interest rate observer thinking required. So uh, with us today, as I mentioned, is Hubert Horan, and uh, with joining me in the grants interest rate observer radio studio is the great Evan Lorenz, and at the dials, Eric Whitehead. Your work on Uber showing that most of their costs are variable and that losses scale as revenue scales um, has been incredible. How did you come to your conclusion? All I was doing was collecting numbers from other published reports, you know, and putting them in one place so you could see, wait a minute, this has been unprofitable from day one and it's still getting worse in year seven. Yeah. And so when you see a lot of the recent news reports, you, you will now see something buried in paragraph five or six. And, oh, by the way, they lost, you know, billions of dollars last year. <laughs> but, you know, this is none of this is uh, confidential information. None of this, you know, the accuracy of this has been confirmed completely. But the idea that this is a company that's got, shall we say, problematic economics is still not of great interest to a lot of the reporters. Yeah. What actually made you start looking into Uber? Just having been in transportation my entire career um, and on the sort of strategic business planning end of things, all of a sudden, all of these stories started coming out about Uber five whatever years ago, saying that it was the, you know, biggest, most, you know, highly valuable private company in world history. <laughs> And it was going to – it had solved all the problems of urban transport and was going to, you know, replace private car ownership at some point. And I sort of scratched my head and said, oh, that's interesting. Wonder how they did that. And everything that was being claimed in all of these uh, articles completely contradicted everything that I and anyone else had known about the economics of transportation. And digging a little more and digging a little more and suddenly found sort of the empty core. It's been amazing to me that uh, so many seemingly intelligent people have pushed so much money into what seems like a bad economic proposition. Um, my read was always that the investment was just, I mean, I'm certainly not an expert on Silicon Valley venture capital, but, you know, it was just the latest fad. You know, you, you could tell three or four things in a quick pitch. Oh, will you know our platform? Ev everyone, everyone in every city around the world will have to have our app on their phone. Um, the Silicon Valley world totally understands the concept of exploiting that kind of monopoly position. And hey, you, you know, it's. Um, it's a gamble, and if it pays off, it pays off real big, and if it, we lose, we shrug and go on to the next one. You know, and then it becomes a fad, and everyone's investing, so I have to get in, too. 
and then it starts to take on a life of its own. Hubert, what is wrong with Uber? Golly, Jim, it's a long list. Uh, number one, they are phenomenally unprofitable, have lost $5 billion in the last two years, and the, the losses are growing, not shrinking. They've never had any possibility of becoming profitable in what you might call a normal competitive market. There's nothing in their business model that introduced any economically meaningful innovation that significantly reduced the cost of providing taxi service or improved the quality or anything else. Um, they were always going after a global monopoly and the ability to exploit that. Uh, and they seem to have hit a major bump in the road on the path to that. Hubert, if, um, if $69 billion is the ostensible market value of this company, and if this company is never going to be profitable because it can't be profitable, what's it worth? That was always a sort of digital question. If it succeeded, I mean, my belief is the investors and senior management at Uber, their objective from day one back in 2010 was a kind of quasi-monopoly position, what Facebook or Amazon has achieved in their industries that could be exploited. And if they didn't achieve that, the value of the company was zero. This was not a company that could ever make money with, say, a 50% share of the market or a 30% share of the market. It had to become the winner-take-all of urban transport. And if it doesn't, the value is zero. So the value is zero, no? That seems to be the path they're on. I don't see any way they get off of the path they're on onto some uh, path where they can make money. Hubert, you, you've spent half of your career consulting with a fairly dysfunctional industry, uh, major airlines. Uber has lost or fired a dozen top executives in the last year or two. It's in fact been without a CFO since 2015. The company's been dogged by dozens of scandals ranging from sexual harassment to interfering with law enforcement to overcharging drivers by millions of dollars. What's your professional view on the management and the operational issues at the company? Two ways to look at it. And again, you have to start from the underlying economics. The challenge Uber faced was that in order to return money to their investors, they had to utterly drive an entire industry of competitors into bankruptcy, competitors who were more efficient than they were. And the second challenge they faced was they had to overwhelm all potential opposition from regulators, doubting journalists, local citizens, and sort of establish this aura of inevitable dominance. To do that, now, this is a huge challenge, and I don't think any of us can think of another company that's done that. Um, they had to establish an absolutely ruthless, hyper-competitive, uh, laws do not apply to us corporate culture. And if, if you take it outside of context, I think part of the answer to your question is that Uber management has been absolutely brilliant. I think this is a case study that will be studied for decades. They created the appearance of a powerful company out of whole cloth. Um, my analogy is, you know, the Nazi blitzkrieg, um, which if you put in the context of World War II and National Socialism was a terrible thing, but if you look very narrowly military tactics and execution, it was brilliant. And I think that's the model here. This was a company that was creating no value for society, was destroying a tremendous amount of value, but they came up with a really brilliant strategy to do it. Uh, for example, public relations, lobbying was a massive spending priority from day one. If you look at every other tech company, Facebook, Google, any of them, they didn't start lobbying and spending money on PR until they really established a profitable business. Uber was spending money without a profitable business. Uh, so they've been really brilliant about this. But it depended on that aura of invincibility 
And in the last six to 12 months, that aura has bubbled and burst. Uh, Hubert, you know, when you when you think, or at least when I think of Uber, um, I think a little bit of Amazon in that in both cases, uh, consumers have, have greatly benefited from business models that were not immediately profitable. In the case of Amazon, uh, the model is becoming profitable, evidently. What do you say to that comparison? And what do you say to the possibility that there is within Uber some, some core business that, if extracted, could be profitable? Um, Amazon's a great point of comparison. If you go back to their early years where they were losing a great deal of money as they were growing, and everyone in the business press was, was saying, golly, this is an interesting company, but I wonder if they can ever make, it, make a dollar of profit. But back then, you could see very clearly they really their business model really had created massive value. They really were establishing massive efficiencies in areas like warehousing and distribution. They really had developed marketing and sales software that totally created all this value for consumers. You suddenly had access to billions of books instantly. Um, it offered suggestions and so forth. Uh, and, and, and you in the press coverage of Amazon back there, people would interview people knowledgeable about e-commerce or warehousing or publishing and say, oh, look at all this cost. They don't have brick-and-mortar stores. It's savings here, savings there, uh, growth potential from all this scale economy and so forth. Not sure whether the sums will all add up at the end of the day. You look at Uber, there's none of that. There's nothing about how they produce taxi cab rides that is remarkably more efficient than the way taxi cab rides have been produced for the last hundred years. But you know, in, in Amazon, fair, in, was going, Amazon was going into a business that had high margins, high prices, and high costs. Uber was going into a business where no one had ever made any money, that had already cut its costs to the absolute bone. If you'd ever gotten into a badly maintained cab driven by someone who barely knew his way around town because he wasn't paid enough to learn that, it was clear. So wait a minute. The typical industry disruption of the Amazons of the world focused on clear opportunities, and they did the hard work of coming up with the efficiencies and product improvements to make dramatic improvements. And Uber didn't do any of that. Hubert, if if um, if zero is the glide path for this company, uh, how do you see events unfolding? Hard to tell because it's such a rare occurrence. Uh, you may think of an example, but I can't, where a company had become this famous, this well regarded throughout the business and general press, and then was revealed to not be based on anything legitimate. I mean, there are lots of companies that go through horrible problems but are go through sort of normal kind of restructuring. And again, you mentioned my airline background. I was involved in many, many of those. But the underlying business of aviation is a real business. And you can look at any individual airline company and say, oh, they overexpanded and they shouldn't have done this. And this bit is uncompetitive. And you can go fix most of those problems. Uber doesn't have a core business that you can go back to. Uh, Hubert, just, just given your extensive work on uh, Uber and the fact that you've been so, you know, in the press uh, in various forms, has the company ever approached you to, to discuss their problems and discuss you potentially consulting with them? No, and I would have been shocked if they had. Um, and again, the kind of economics that I've been trying to publicize is stuff that's been on the public record from other sources, and they've never challenged any any of those sources either. Okay, uh, Hubert, to play devil's advocate just for one second, in the last few weeks, Uber has shifted from its pricing strategy from charging users a fare based off of distance and uh, and time to charging users what they think they'll pay. So if, uh, if you're going from like the Met to like a Tony part of Manhattan, they might charge you more than if you're going from like, you know, uh, a school to like, um, uh, you know, a hospital. They're, but they're still paying drivers a fare based off of um, you know distance and speed. Is this a way they can actually create a sustainable business? And if so, how much above their traditional fares would they have to charge to make this a viable business? Um, 
Short answer, no, absolutely not. A slightly longer answer is that, remember, the entire Uber business model is based on becoming a globally dominant company. This isn't that yellow cab of Denver has come up with a slightly clever fare structure as it competes with discount fare cab of Denver and might be, you know, can improve their profit margin 8% over the competition. If Uber doesn't own the entire world, or at least sort of the first world parts of it, they collapse. Uber's investors have put in $13 billion. They didn't put in $13 billion because there was a way to make money at a 40% share of the Denver taxi market. You were the uh, the yellow cabs of the world have been uh, uh, badly hit by the Uber phenomenon. Insofar as uh, Uber is not viable, might there be a revival in the conventional cab business? If Uber does collapse, and I don't think that will happen anytime soon just because so many people have so much invested in, in trying to prevent that. Um, but yes, uh, there'll be an opportunity for them to come back. But the traditional yellow cab business was a cutthroat, zero profitability business. Um, And there's still, you know, people complain you can't get a cab when it rains or on Saturday night or when I land at LaGuardia. Those problems haven't been fixed and those won't go away. There won't won't be a flowering of new investment from people who figured out Uber's mistakes and will come up with a clever model. It's a very tough business. No one, no one really anywhere in the world makes what you would consider real private sector profits, the kind that would attract serious investment out of urban transport, expressways or bus systems or subways or commuter railroads, because the economics of urban transport do not lend themselves at all to traditional private sector, you know, get a reasonable low risk return on investment. And and yet in the city of New York, the one of the great investments uh, pre Uber was thought to be and indeed was by some measures uh, the purchase of a New York City taxi medallion. Medallion prices have, have crashed uh, on account of Uber. Might they not make a recovery? of New York City taxi medallions was featured in most of Uber's early publicity, it's complete red herring. Only a handful of U.S. cities ever had tradable medallions, and the only two other than New York where they ever became value were Boston and Chicago. So medallions are irrelevant to taxi economics. Taxi medallions in New York became valuable because there were several banks that would traditionally lent to taxicab companies when the interest rate environment collapsed in 2008 and thereafter, oh, here is the potential alternative investment, and it's protected by regulation. Well, that's gone. If you look at the past history of the taxi cab industries, those kind of inflated values were a, a one-time anomaly of interest rate environment, only occurred in a couple cities, mostly New York. And those conditions will not be repeated. Hubert, in the, in the first quarter, uh, Uber lost uh, more than $700 million, and uh, it seems to have uh, a $7.2 billion, which gives the company uh, about uh, two and a half years of life at current burn rates. So if you were, uh, as improbable as it might seem, if you were uh, retained at the top of this company to turn things around, uh, what would you do? I would pay $7.2 billion to not take that job. <laughs> well, um, I, you know, I, I, there, was, there was a famous, there was a famous uh, saying one of the airline CEOs a number of years ago was asked, what, you know, what would you do if you were hired to become the CEO of United? And he said, I would run as far and as fast as I possibly could um, away from that mess. Um I would shut the company down. I would save those $7.2 billion rather than throw them in the furnace. But that's why no one's going to ask me for my advice on that question. 
uh, Hubert, I, I know that you've kind of laid out in extensive detail that the microeconomics of, uh, of running a taxi service, whether you're Uber or, you know, yellow uh, cab, are mostly variable cost. And as you grow, those costs grow, which is why you don't get the leverage that you get if you're Amazon and you're running a series of uh, distribution centers where you can just run more books or more, you know, things through it. Um, but it does seem like there is a genuine innovation in terms of the app, which means that as a New Yorker, I no longer have to stand on the side of the street and potentially get a taxi that, you know, uh, stolen from me by somebody who jumped the queue in front of me and like hailed it in fr- uh, just a few feet in front of me. And it does seem like the app is something that actually creates, I mean, value for me as a customer. I, I use Uber and Lyft and it's a lot more convenient than getting a taxi. How how has the, that part of the technology changed, I guess, the ecosystem for uh, taxis or ride hailing or the, the universe? Because it seems like it's something consumers want and they'll still want once Uber, you know, kicks the bucket. Two answers. Yes, clearly a lot of people seem to like the app. But if you look at dozens and dozens of other consumer product industries, all of whom have migrated from telephone or in-person sales to Internet and smartphones, that migration has had essentially no impact on competition or corporate value. So how... Is the how, how can you say the Uber app contributed to the $68 billion valuation? Second answer is that people didn't love the Uber app because it had the most brilliant user interface. People liked the Uber app because when they pushed it, they got much faster delivery of a taxi. There were more taxis available at lower prices. That all came from the mass, those billions and billions of dollars of subsidies. Take away the subsidies, though the cab availability drops and the price goes up. Suddenly, Uber's app won't be quite so beloved. There's some marginal value to the migration to smartphone apps, but that was something that was, you know, my local cab company here in Phoenix has the exact same kind of software. It works fine, and it says the next cab will be in 30 minutes. Well, Hubert, this has been merely fabulous. And the next time we talk, we're going to explore the, um, uh, the parallels, but potential parallels between uh, uh, the heavily subsidized Uber and the heavily subsidized Tesla. But that's for another time. You have been very kind with your time and with your insights. And we thank you, Hubert. Hubert Horan, aviation consultant turned most perceptive uh, critic and analyst of, uh, of Uber. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening. Until next time, this is Grant's Interest Rate Observer. 